Hello and welcome back to BSG webinars. This is our third special edition of Humulus U. My name is Dan Carney, graphic design manager at BSG, coming to you from my home office in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Thanks for joining us. This is our 17th episode and our third Humulus U episode. Normally, we hold a one-day hop symposium in Yakima, Washington, but as everyone knows, we will have to take a break from getting together. So we decided we wanted to bring Humulus U to wherever you are. Before I introduce today's guest, I'd like to remind everyone that both of last week's webinars, the U.S. Hop Crop Report by Jessica Reel of Double R Hop Ranches and the Brewers Panel is available on our YouTube channel. Just search BSG Craft in, your U in YouTube and subscribe to see all the videos that we have. Also, if you haven't done so yet, please register for the upcoming Humulus U webinar. You can register for them and any other upcoming webinars at bsgcraft.com forward slash webinars, or by going to bsgcraftbrewing.com and clicking on the webinars tile. This Friday, we'll be talking about biotransformation and hop flavor with Patty Aaron, our manager of research and innovation at the RAR Technical Center. So please register for that one if you haven't done so already. So now on to today's presentation. First, I'd like to ask that throughout the webinar, if you have questions, please do it through the Q&A function. It's the center of the toolbar below. After the presentation, we'll be opening up for a few questions. So with that, I would like to welcome our guests, Emily and Wayne. Hello. Hello. Howdy. How's it going? Doing well. Not too shabby. <laughs> All right. Well, Emily and Wayne, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves and uh, kind of go on with the presentation. Perfect. And uh, just again, want to say thank you and welcome. No problem. So my name is Emily Delbell. I am the uh, sensory scientist at RAR Technical Center located here in Shakopee, Minnesota. Um, lab is in the background currently, so you can see a little bit of what we do here. Um, I have a, a food science degree both from Oregon State University um, through the Food and Fermentation Science Department at Oregon State in Corvallis and one from the University of Minnesota in St. Paul, Minnesota. So I've done a number of different uh, previous lives, but this is my first job working in beer and I have to say I love it. It's my favorite uh, thing that I could have ever been working on. So. I'm um, really happy to be here with you all today and teach you a little bit about what we know about hops and sensory. Uh, and I am Wayne Sheck. Uh, I am the Director of Strategic Marketing here at BSG. Uh, I also have a background in food science, so I have my food science degree from Rutgers University back in New Jersey. Um, but I have since pivoted to the marketing world. Um, before this, I spent some time doing product development for uh, bakery products. I spent some time working in a sensory lab. I spent some time at a flavor company. Uh, so I have quite a background in sensory and it's something that Emily and I, I know are both really passionate about. Um, and one of the things you'll probably see from the two of us is we come at sensory, you know, from a more generic food background. So you'll get a taste for some of the sensory tips that we give you our, our four beer definitely and four hops definitely, but we'll probably give you some tips for sensory beyond just what you'll see from beer. So, um, as Emily said, really excited to be here and really to, excited to chat with you guys about something we're both super passionate about. Sure. All right, let me get this presentation up. Start that slideshow and uh, here we go. All right, so again, this is the Nose Nose Hop Sensory with Emily and Wayne. And today we're going to be covering, um, as Wayne said, we're going to be coming at sensory kind of from a generic standpoint. So we're going to be talking a little bit about sensory basics, some of the methodologies that we use personally in the lab and that can be used to evaluate hops um, particularly. We're going to go a little bit into hop components, um, hop oils particularly, what those flavors and fragrances that hop oils contribute. Um, and then we're going to do some actual sensory ourselves. Um, so we will be evaluating a pair of hops that um, BSG uh, produces. So, 
All right, so Wayne, what do you think of when you think of sensory science? It's kind of a big, broad spectrum. I wanna hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think the really generic definition of sensory <laughs> science is tasting, which is such a, uh, uh, you know, boiling down of all that goes into it. And I think, you know, what you have here is really the, the, the crux of what it is, which really is trying to convert people into a quantitative measure. Yes. I think that there are many different types of sensory work and I can't tell you how many times both in, in, in this job and in previous jobs and, and you do it to me too sometimes. I know, I was going like, to have to apologize. <laughs> Emily, I want you to run a sensory test. Okay, Wayne, what do we want to know? <laughs> so um, there are many different ways to come at sensory. I think, I think like you said, the biggest generic or the biggest overview of that is let's taste the product. Let's smell the product. Let's see what we see. Um, but in the, the RAR Technical Center, and especially um, from a lot of the previous work that I've done where you're actually trying to quantify that, we need to have a question. We need to know what is, what is the question we are trying to answer. Are we looking for marketing material? Are we looking to see what are the differences between these? Are we looking to quantify an amount of flavor of a particular kind that we're looking for? There are lots of different ways to go about that. So we can dive a little bit more into that. But first, oops, first what I wanna do is kind of break down when we talk about let's taste it, let's smell it. What are the terms that we're using? And I think even in the sensory industry, we have a tendency to get kind of sloppy with some of the words that we use, especially um, particularly taste and flavor. So, Bringing you back to biology class here, you have a nose that smells by breathing in through it. And the way that you perceive the odorants or the molecules that are brought in through your nose, um, they, they make contact with um, your sensory nerves, which I always touch kind of right up here because it's in the back of your um, back in your skull. So if you have a stuffy nose, if you're congested, if you have an injury, all of those nerves are actually very easily disrupted. So your sense of smell can change from day to day. It's also extremely sensitive um, and it can perceive hundreds of different components. Um, so when we talk about orthonasal olfaction is what we're referring to when we talk to about smell. Retronasal olfaction is actually what most people talk of when they're talking about flavor. When you put a jelly bean, for example, in your mouth, if you plug your nose and don't breathe in through your nose, all you're actually going to be perceiving is the sweetness on your taste buds of the sugar, maybe a little bit of, you know, funny mouthfeel from the wax coating on the jelly bean. Um, if you're drinking a beer, you're getting that carbonation, which we'll talk about in just a second, which is that trigeminal sensation, but you're not actually getting any flavor until you release your nose and breathe in. And then all of a sudden, all of those molecules that have been in your mouth are released up through the back of your nasal cavity into that same perception area. But it comes across and can come across as two different ways because of that interaction in your um, between your mouth and your taste buds and your, uh, your olfactory bulb. And to that point, Emily knows I'm gonna go off on this topic because it's one of the things I'm really passionate about is the, the fact that um, the olfactory receptors that Emily has here, uh, as far as your brain is, is actually positioned right next to your hippocampus, which is the mm -hmm. part of your brain that, uh, that controls memory. So when people like to talk about food memories and taste memories and, and scent memories, the reason that they are so strong is because those two biologically are actually very close to each other and have a tendency to trigger each other. So when we get into the tasting portion of this, I'll talk about this quite a bit, but I strongly believe when you do tasting that if you're having a reaction that's triggering some sort of memory in your head when you smell something, run with that. And you really have to dissect that because those are the things that are going to really help you in your sensory, is trying to touch that back to to uh, to what you're perceiving. And exactly. then to, to the concept of retronasal olfaction, 
when I do my sensory, I actually spend the vast majority of my time smelling because we both know that aroma is actually 80 to 90 percent of, of everything that you're perceiving when it comes to sensory. But there is always this small portion that will not be triggered unless you do retronasal olfaction. So I do make it a point after I write down all of my initial thoughts when I'm smelling something to make sure that I do taste it and see what different aromas I specifically get through my mouth because there are different things that you will perceive. So along with actual basic taste, you've got to pay attention to some of those olfactory, retronasal olfactory, or some of those aromas that you get while you're doing your actual taste. Exactly, exactly. There is a common practice in wine, professional wine tasting, for example, is to always spit the wine so that you're not consuming large amounts of alcohol. But I would highly recommend, and most of them do, is to eat, to swallow at least just a little bit because the taste buds that you have actually coat your yep. entire digestive tract. Yeah, um, I was gonna make that same comment. Yeah. Like, that's a thing that most people don't know is that taste buds do go beyond your tongue and do actually go into your throat. And now there's research that says it's all throughout your, your GI tract. Exactly. But to that point, right, if you do not swallow, you will not be able to get everything. Um, you will get most things, the reality, but there are things that you potentially could miss if you do not swallow. That being said, I do not ever ask anyone to taste hot tea. So <laughs> <laughs> I have had some panelists do that. It's extremely bitter and it's extremely hard to get anything more out of that once you've kind of flooded your system with bitterness. So yeah, I there are definitely thing with, exceptions. <laughs> same thing with hot pellets. Probably don't want to chomp don't down chew on, on hot pellets. <laughs> Um, any more that we want to say on this? I guess the, the only other thing we haven't really covered is the trigeminal nerve, which again is kind of, uh, it's responsible for all the sources of sensation in your mouth. Um, carbonation for beer is the, is the, probably the biggest menthol. You'll get that menthol tingling feeling. You can actually get that from hops without tasting it if it's strong enough. Um, and then you can have those heat and spicy and capsaicin responses. And there are many different actual kinds of um, sources of those sensations, um, but those are the big ones. Yeah, and I would say too that trigeminal is, is commonly referred to as like physical responses. It's yes. really more of a physical response than it is any sort of smell or, or, or taste even. Mm -hmm. And I think where I see a lot of people get tripped up when it comes to sensory is the difference between trigeminal spicy and aroma spicy. Yes. Something can smell like peppers without being trigeminal spicy like a pepper. And when yes. it comes yes. to hops, you can have things that are spicy like black pepper or, or ginger, but mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily physically react on your tongue. So you have to be able to tease those two things apart and not always lump them together. Yes, spicy is a pretty generic category when it comes to aroma descriptors. And primarily what we are gonna talk about um, is, is aroma today because hops are used for bittering. Obviously that from a kettle standpoint, there is a big component to that, but there's, there's fairly much, a, pretty much a formula that brewers use for that. What we're gonna be talking about is how do you select and how, how do you pick these hop aromas out? All right, so I kind of mentioned this a little bit already, but um, there are a number of different methods that we utilize to evaluate the hops here at the Technical Center. Um, the kind of classic one that you see in, um, you know, literature and in, uh, we, we were just talking about this yesterday, hop selection is kind of going on right now. And obviously this year it's a whole different methodology, um, but the hop rub, um, and Wayne and I both have some kind of strong opinions about whether or not that's the best way to do it, but it is one way to do it, um, where you take the, the hops themselves and rub them between your hands. I think the biggest disadvantage of that is that you're left with green hands, um, that then you can't carry that over. Even if you wash your hands, you're still going to be, um, have these aromas left on your hands. Um, but it is a good source, especially if you're out in the field and don't have any other way to evaluate it. So there's definitely a time and place for doing the hop rub. The hop grind is one that we tend to utilize, and we're actually going to be doing that um, later on during the presentation, um, is just taking the hop pellets or the hop cones themselves and putting them in a magic bullet is what we use here. Um, it's pretty easy to clean 
it's dyed green a little bit, but we can wash it out in between. We use a little blower to, to make sure we get all the lupulin off in between samples. Um, and that can give you a really good idea of what the fresh hops themselves smell like when they've been pulverized and kind of the aromas are released. There are some disadvantages to that as well, like any of these, is that it becomes very light sensitive. Um, the, the once you've uh, ground them up, ASBC has a really good method on how much to portion into the cup, how to keep them light sensitive, how what the time frame is to evaluate them in. I believe it's three or four hours, um, and we keep them covered in the meantime to keep them from being exposed to light. Hop tea is another one that we utilize here, and Wayne and I've had this discussion a lot about the, the comparing and contrasting of the hop profiles that you get when you're grinding it versus doing the tea. In some cases, we actually do both because hop tea takes a smaller volume of hops, mixes it with room temperature water, and then circulates that. You can either put it on a stir plate or just stir it for about 20 minutes. And in that case, you're actually getting rid of a lot of that really volatile um, kind of pungent aroma that in the hot grind really burns your nose out very quickly. Um, and then you're kind of able to sift through by that dilute um, hop matrix to kind of tease some of the other. It does have a tendency to accentuate some more of that type of oxidized characteristics that you can see, but we'll talk about this a little later. Oxidized doesn't necessarily mean bad in the case of hops. So it's just two different ways to contrast. Both of these are very accessible for anybody to do. You don't need a magic bullet, just you know, crush it in a mallet with a plastic bag. Um, you know, if you're doing hot tea, you don't even need to blend it ahead of time. Just again, crush it up and mix it with water. ASBC methods have really good ideas on where to start for the, the ratios, um, but you can definitely, anybody does this. We use a French press, but you don't have to. Um, and then probably the, this is going from easiest to, to, to most difficult. The Randall, I would say, is then our kind of our next level of uh, evaluation and what we actually do is we this is our system here we've got a lovely uh, tap set up for them we can grind up the hops we put it into these um, water filter systems that our coworker put together uh, Bobby and um, then you run the beer through the lines and it actually does essentially a mini kind of hop rocket style and so you're actually able to evaluate what potentially the beer would taste like if it's dry hopped to some extent. So you're getting the flavors of the beer, but you're also getting that hop carrier. So you'll get things that are more alcohol soluble. You're getting um, a little bit of retention time, depending on how long you let that bag of hops sit in there. You can actually control how strongly the hops evaluate. You might get some minor biotransformation effects, depending on, again, how long you let it sit and whatever. But we'd actually find that as a really good way to kind of, again, dilute the hops down, see what it tastes like in the matrix of a beer. Um, and then obviously the best way to kind of predict what it's gonna do in a beer is to brew with it. So obviously that takes a lot more resources and a lot more time. Um, we do have a pilot scale brewery here. We utilize that a lot. And a lot of times what we'll do is do a comparison of one or two or three of these methods, so. Yeah, I would say the main idea here, you've kind of alluded to Emily, is like there's no correct way to do it. Correct. There are just multiple methods and each method will give you a slightly different result. You know, when we do things like develop our, our hop blends that, that we sell, we go through several different iterations of this while we're going through the process. So we'll start with, you know, many potential blends. We'll do grind and we'll do tea and we'll do rubbing initially. We'll mm -hmm. start narrowing that down. Then we'll go to Randall's and we'll narrow it down some more. And then we'll go and brew full beers with the highest potential items. So, you know, all of these bring their own different aspects to it. I, I think at the end of the day, it's really what you have access to, what you have time to, to do, and, and, you know, all of them will give you valid information. Wayne and I don't feel as though there is one white way to do anything. And so we are often trying, you know, there's, sometimes there's a better way. Um, right. But whatever the way works for you is what's best. 
So I would say if we had all the resources in the world, I would brew a beer with everything. But even then, there's natural multiple variation. beers. <laughs> even then, there's natural variation with biotransformation and what yeast. You're, yep. There are so many variables here, so it's really just about getting to the best answer that you can with the with what's available. Yep. This is a lot. This is kind of my method for evaluating a sample. Um, I find that this method works best for me. This is a suggestion. Wayne, I think, does it a little bit differently. Um, but when I'm training new sensory panelists, this is how I instruct them to kind of start. You know, when you're looking at a sample, I'm just going to grab my hop here. When you're looking at a sample, you, you know, look at it in case of beer. Um, you just kind of want to go through a checklist. And so you have an idea of what's the information I'm trying to get out of this sample so that you're not you know, for me, appearance I do first because I always forget to do it. I'm so interested in smelling the hops or smelling I the always, beers. <laughs> I always intend to do appearance first and I accidentally smell it first and then I go, oh wait, appearance, I close yeah. it. I it. <laughs> I, we're just so excited to smell it that we just want to pick the lid open and smell it. So I'm like, okay, appearance. So then I, you know, for hops, I'm going to write down the color. I'm going to, you know, whether or not there's any brown characteristics to it. For hops, I'm not going into too much, at least when it comes to um, the grind. Um, those ones I'll actually tend to do more when I'm preparing the samples and I'll have like six samples. Then I can say, oh, that one stands out as looking different and I may provide that feedback. But in yeah. terms of a general sensory panelist, probably not as much information for, for um, you. Again, smell. As Wayne said, 80 to 90% of the information, spend more time smelling than you think you need to because everyone has a tendency to taste. And once you taste, your reset time is longer. When we talk about time spent in between samples, it's actually a lot easier to smell, put it down, take a break, give your your senses time to kind of rest and recover. Often if I'm wearing a scarf, I'll sniff there or people will sniff yeah, their they, arms. Yeah, like inner elbow. You do the inner elbow because, and part of that reason is because you're smelling something different. So you're kind of, you know, people, there's, I think some tasters use coffee grounds, you know, all of that is just like a diversion so that when you come back to the sample, you can actually perceive it again. Um, but once you taste that sample, all of a sudden it's coating the inside of your mouth, it's coating your, your throat, and it takes longer for that to go away. So giving yourself enough time with that smell will give you a lot more information. And, there not, are many just, oh, God, yeah, no. and not just that, I was gonna say, I, uh, I spend 80% of my time just sitting and smelling and closing and opening. It's also mm -hmm. the reality of creating small um, atmospheric equilibration of, of aromatic compound. So keeping a, a closed headspace and then opening it back up to yourself will help with some of those flavors. Um, but to your point about leaving and coming back, if I have a small set of samples, I will do everything twice. Yes. Because not only is like giving your nose a way to like relax and then come back to it, but you smell things differently when you're going through a bunch of hops. And the first things you smell are not calibrated kind of to what your nose is expecting for hops yet. So you might just get hit by things because your nose is kind of shocked and your brain is kind of shocked a bit. So smell it. I always say for people to write down the first things that come to their mind. Again, this is that sense memory piece. But I believe like I always do a first smell and I go, what did I just get? Write that down really quickly and then go back to it and do more intense. But come back to it after you've done everything and check your work and be like, do I still get that? Or was some of this just kind of shock? Because yeah. you will find that things change when you really switch back around. Definitely, definitely. And we have a tendency here to kind of give everybody all the samples all at once and we give them as an order in which to perceive it, but we don't prevent you from going back and evaluating. And once you do, if you go, you know, kind of linear, linearly through a set of sample four and you come back to it, you'll actually find that that first sample's probably smells different than when you tasted it the first time. Now, I will say that from an academic standpoint, that is the wrong way to say this. <laughs> wrong way. I'm not going to tell you that that's the wrong way here because right now we're trying to get the most information that we can in the shortest period of time, essentially. Um, but from an academic standpoint, I will acknowledge that no, no 
well-designed large consumer sensory study will ever give you your samples back. You will get one at a time and that's right. it. <laughs> but to that point, when we're talking about like study, that will all be randomized in the study itself. Yes, so like that will be kind of taken care of with the size of the study and the way that samples are given. But to your point, we're talking like, hey, it's me and my other dude in the brew house. What do we smell here? Let's make sure it's cool. Yeah, exactly. So again, there's a lot of different ways to smell. We talked about kind of the little burp method where you kind of poke your nose in. You can, you know, lift it up and kind of let some of that, you know, um, headspace disappear, uh, dissipate. Um, you can do different kinds of sniffs between like the little bunny sniff to the long sniff where you actually will perceive it very differently, um, especially if you give yourself time in between. And then with beer, especially, you're gonna wanna give that a swirl, you know, and here we'll actually do the shake to kind of like mix it up a little bit. I have so um, many more comments, but I wanna be conscious. I know, I know, I want, I'm kind of looking at the time going, oh man, we're already on time. Okay, so um, plugging nose to taste, release the nose, get your retronasal, the taste we already talked about, the swallow we already talked about. I think um, in terms of the actual protocol, like I said, figure out what's best for you. These are our suggestions, but especially if you're working in um, a brew house or somewhere that's highly fragrant, you know, try to get away and try to give yourself time. That would be my biggest advice here. So there's obviously lots of other questions um, that you can consider. We talked about experimental design yeah, a little we did. bit. Look at us. Yeah, <laughs> we talked about what is the question you're looking at. Lexicon is a big one. Um, we use different lexicons depending on whether we're evaluating hops or beer, um, and that is something that there are many different resources out there online available for you. Reference standards is something that we utilize sometimes here. Um, and that, again, it just depends on the project and what we're trying to look at. But both Wayne and I are kind of fans of the whole food reference standards, going to the grocery store, getting your citrus and your flowers and your, you know, strawberries or whatever, and using those to train your nose rather than use chemical compounds reference standards. However, there are many labs that are very successful with utilizing um, those, those commercially available standards. Or if that's what you have in your brewery and you need to know, hey, what does, you know, methionol smell like and that's what you've got, pull it out, so. And then yeah, and I would, Go yeah, ahead. I would say when it comes to lexicon, the one thing I always tell people is just because it's not on a lexicon doesn't make it wrong. Yes. Lexicons are meant to help guide and they're meant to give you some things that you can use. But I use a lot of weird terms when I describe food um, because it comes from sense memory and I'm trying to just get a point across. Um, and sometimes you can tease those out a little bit and translate them into true lexicon terms. But don't move away from a descriptor just because it's not captured in the lexicon. Um, and to the point of training, I, I think you and I both agree on this, but like, best way to get better at this is to keep doing it um, and the more you can smell things and just be really present when you're smelling things when you're tasting things you'll be able to reflect back on those memories and it just makes you better at, at, at extrapolating from your initial thoughts correct and we're happy to answer some more questions later on about this i think we're definitely getting a little loads <laughs> we knew this was going to happen we talked we about, about certain things so Hops are made up of many different things. This is actually a picture of our hop oil setup. Here we extract the oils of our hops um, to then run them through our GC to figure out what's in them. And surprisingly enough, the stuff other than the acids that we care about are the smallest portion of the hops, um, 0.5 to 3.5% essential oils. And I, the, the thing I always say here, and I'm trying not to like just keep rambling, but the, the, um, the threshold for where you detect these essential oils is all over the place. Yes. So just because we can get GC run on this and we can see that there's a lot of X oil, that doesn't mean that that is the most prominent aroma. If something at a smaller amount has a much lower threshold for when you will perceive it. So... Right. The quantitation of essential oil components does not always translate directly into what it smells like. So 
So again, as we talk through hops, and if you see a hop spec sheet, you'll see some essential oils on there. That is great information to have and can give you kind of some insights into what it might smell like. But the best way to really describe hops is to smell it. Yeah, putting together a recipe of, you know, if you took those top five hop oils and took them and built them into a analogs a matrix, it would not smell like the hop that you just took them from. I worked at a flavor company. I can attest to that all too well. <laughs> a lot of companies flavor. try to do that. It doesn't work. Creating flavor is very difficult. Yes. So these are kind of the big hop oils that you may see. Some of them are uh, available on some of our spreadsheet or our uh, spec sheets. Some of them are not. Um, a lot of them are also analogous to um, the herbal or the citrus or the other sources that they're from. So we'll often use the descriptors um, in a similar way. So myrcene, for example, uh, to me, myrcene just is carrot, which I don't, I still am working on getting over myrcene equals carrot, I'll be honest. But a lot of other people perceive that as just a real green herbaceous kind of smell. It's got I that get, pungency. I get grass. Myrcene yeah. for me is grass. Yeah. That's all I get. And it's in, uh, it's found in a lot of other herbs such as bay, parsley, and our friend cannabis. Um, Carophylline, farnesine. I don't think we're going to go through this too much right now, Wayne. I think this is just like a reference point for you. Um, if you're curious to look more into what these um, particular hop oils are, they are all available for purchase out there in a refined standard. So if you want to train your nose, for example, to smell more of what linalool wool smells like, and maybe you can use that as a addition to your lexicon. Maybe when you and your uh, coworkers are talking about this one component that you really like in hops, and you, you guys all of a sudden are smelling things, you're like, oh, that's linalool. Now you have a common vocabulary method, and that's what those lexicons are really about, is to kind of get us all on the same page. Um, but again, right. if linalool doesn't work for you and lavender works actually better for you, then do that. And I would say to that point, and what we were saying before about like thresholds of perception, just because linalool is something in something, it's in cinnamon and it's in mint. And those mm -hmm. things are very different. They are. So know that just because linalool is present doesn't mean that it's going to define what you're smelling. So Emily and I both have a tendency to go more towards, if we're using descriptors, I'll always use either the descriptors here or even the like food it's found in to describe how I'm feeling because I find that sometimes that can get you closer to what you're really looking for. Yeah. And as Patty will be talking about in next week's webinar, just because they're in the hops doesn't mean they will be in your beer. Because totally. biotransformation is a huge portion of hop chemistry and we are not going into that today. <laughs> <laughs> That's for come, Thursday. Come next week, there we Save go. your questions for Thursday. All right. So Wayne and I have some samples of uh, beer, or excuse me, of hops here to evaluate. Um, we wish that we could have had you in person here to evaluate them, but I would highly encourage you to take these, uh, take this time to just kind of see what we're doing, see how we're going through this, and um, do it again on your own later, and reach out with questions if you have any. All right, Ryan, why don't you take that away? Yeah, so with Centennial, I'm sitting here, you know, again, a lot of this is about use the tools that you have available. I'm not in that lab with Emily, so I don't have a grinder at home. So all I did was take a jar, put my pellets in it, and I've been shaking furiously for about an hour and a half now, <laughs> trying to break these down as much as I can. Um, but, but whatever you have works as long as you can do it. But I, I would highly suggest something with a lid and keep the lid on whenever you're not tasting. So again, you can get that equilibration of the actual uh, headspace that you have in there. So I'm gonna skip appearance on these because we're, we're looking at hot pellets and I don't think that's the biggest portion of it. I think we're really focused on aroma today and that's what we wanna try and get across to you guys. But the first thing I always do whenever I'm tasting or smelling something is I open it up, I smell it, and I write down my initial thoughts. Sometimes they are gibberish and they mean nothing, um, but I use it as a way to guide what my initial thought is. So the first time I smelled this, 
and I did it right before this so I would have it fresh on mind. Um, the words I wrote down were fruity, bright, and sweet, which are the most generic words in the world, but it lets me then go to the lexicon and use this as a way to try and tease out um, what I'm feeling. So I then walk through a lexicon that, that I have and that we use in the lab sometimes to try and figure out what I'm getting. So when it comes to citrus, which we have listed here, I specifically put that we have a lot of pith and peel. And Emily and I talked about this a bit before yeah. this and, and really agree that on both of these samples actually, what comes across when we talk citrus is a lot of peel. So you're getting a lot of that bitterness and it's not necessarily like I'm smelling orange juice. Yeah. Um, when we're talking about citrus, I specifically got tangerines and mandarin oranges, like some of those um, more bitter, more, more tannic-y uh, citrus fruits. Um, I then moved on to tropical fruit and Emily and I, when we were discussing this before, got the same thing of, I get this note of dairy um, mm -hmm. and creaminess that really yeah. pushes me towards lychee and guava, like some of those more um, creamy dairy focus. I get a little bit of passion fruit, um, but really it's some of that like creamsicle-y fruit and dairy notes. I wrote um, creme caramel down, even though I don't know what that means. I must have heard it read. That was the first thing for me. I don't <laughs> know what that means, but again, like, like kind of digging into a little bit more for sure. Yeah. And then when we go beyond tropical fruit, and it's kind of the tropical fruit too, but when I look at some of these other notes, the biggest thing that came to mind for me was candy. I get a lot of candy in the sample we have. Specifically, I get watermelon. And again, we're gonna go to sense memory. I have a very strong affiliation of Sour Patch watermelons when I smell this. It's the first thing that comes to my mind. So when I try to unpack that, it's yes, obviously that means that I smell watermelon, but a Sour Patch watermelon smells very different than an actual watermelon. So it's specifically watermelon on the very candy side of it. And then when I start to unpack that, I get a lot of those like fruit type gum, tutti fruity jelly beans I wrote down. Just like a lot of those candy, generic, fruit punchy, tropical notes, um, which really guides my mind to say, when I smell this, I smell candied fruit, which is a very specific description. Which um, you will note is not on our right. spider chart and is really spider one of those things, yeah. Will give you overarching themes, but we're gonna interpret all of these very differently. Um, Beyond that, when I get to the floral piece, I definitely get rose, and then I get some of that like mint. Um, I get rose water, like very specifically, like the, the food side of rose water. Mm -hmm. um, I very distinctly got lemongrass, and, and I went back to our spec sheet, and I was very excited to see that we put lemongrass as an actual descriptor. But <laughs> when I'm writing things down, I underline things, I bold things, I exclamation point when I get to something, and I'm like, yes, that's what I'm talking about. So. Then what I'll do is I'll write a summary for myself of like, now I wrote down all these words, but at the end of the day, what am I smelling? And I specifically put candied fruit, um, citrus peel, and lemongrass. That if you were to ask me, what does this smell like? That is the summary I would give you. Um, I didn't get a ton of pine in the sample, but obviously it's there. Some people are gonna perceive it. I know I'm not super sensitive to pine. It's another thing we didn't talk about, but everybody is, sensitive differently to different compounds, and I, this might be a blindness for me. Um, I yeah. actually, the longer I've sat with this, Wayne, the more that fresh cut pine has come across to me. I think I'm interpreting a lot of that pine as spice because I did yes. write down ginger clove, and mm -hmm. I think that you could easily say that clove and pine could be interpreted very similarly. Or, or at least ginger for me, for sure. Clove, I can see that it's in that kind of same like it's that like woodiness aspect mm -hmm, of some of those exactly other. exactly, and to me I wrote down mojito which is nice. you know kind of a very minty limey you know tropical -y characteristic to it so so if you had to give it a summary Emily what would you say <laughs> um, I definitely had I think for me mojito lime um, I think bright resin which I again colors and and tones yeah. are, are something that we've talked a little bit about um, they don't interpret well necessarily to this kind of work but when we're talking about something when I'm talking about bright I'm feeling it more up in my face whereas I'm talking about something dark I'm kind of feeling it back more and that actually has to do with um, 
with both your perceptions of you know what I'm, I'm not even going to get into that because it's so complicated i will say when i wrote down yeah. right i used yeah. that to guide me and as i was going through the fruit side of it i said you know actually when i say bright i'm saying i don't get a lot of jamminess and i don't yes. get a lot of berry but yeah. i do get a lot of citrus and i get a lot of tropical yeah. you know so yeah. it's about that's learning, a good way to put it it's about learning how to translate your own thoughts a lot of the yes time. and making it again not just it translating your own thoughts but aligning your thoughts with someone else's exactly and making sure that you're getting information that is actionable yeah and and i do want to move on to the last one but one yes. of the things on that that i will say is tasting with other people is a very powerful tool i would say take your time and do your evaluations alone but mm -hmm. then share your results because someone saying something will trigger you perceiving things differently sometimes for the better and sometimes for the worse. Um, but I would say, do your tasting alone, but then talk with somebody about what you're seeing. There's never a wrong answer in tasting. That yeah. should be step one. There is never a wrong answer. Everyone okay. perceives what they perceive, but just chat with somebody and, and try and figure out why you're using the terms that you're using. Like we just did with mine. Yep. All right, let's go on to 1228. So 1228 is the hop solution that Emily and I worked very intimately on. Um, the goal here was something really intended for a West Coast IPA. So we're talking pine for sure, but then we also wanted to bring in some of these new world aromas that we associate with IPA. So that citrus and tropical fruit and some of that sweet fruit. Um, when I went to this first, you know, we're talking colors. The first thing I wrote down was darker. And again, now that we're tasting these two side by side, we are going to inherently compare them. You yes. don't necessarily want to do that, but I also would say don't avoid it entirely. It's Use actually it a really good way to teach yourself about what something, because a lot of times you're, if you're new to it, you're going to sit down and you'll be like, I don't know what it smells like. And then you smell the other one. You're like, well, it's different from this in this manner. Yeah. I would say use it to guide your thinking, but don't let it completely bias your thinking. Right. Um, so general themes I wrote down were darker. I wrote down more herbal. I got a very specific thing, and we'll talk about sense memory in a second. And then I got wrote down cooked. Um, mm -hmm. And again, trying to tease out what that means, and I won't extrapolate as much as I did on the last one, because again, conscious of time. Um, but when we talk about tropical fruit, I specifically wrote down cooked tropical fruit. I wrote down caramelized pineapple, and some of those like, um, I used to work in the bakery industry, guava pastries are a thing. I definitely get that like cooked guava dairy note. Mm -hmm. um i also wrote down jammy i think i do get berry on this one um a little bit but it's specifically like red fruit jam um cooked down more intense um more savory side of it and then sense memory i spent a lot of spent time when i was working at a flavor company specifically working on tea specifically working on earl gray tea and specifically working on bergamot flavor and when I would go home from work, I would stink of bergamot. And the first thing I smelled when I smelled this was Earl Grey tea and bergamot. And I can't move away from it. So talk about sense memory. That's just something I know I am super sensitive to. And I get a lot of bergamot on the scent. And, and see, for me, when I initially smelled it, I initially thought kefir lime, as in yeah. Thai food. And that kind of like really lovely um, herbal, sweet, um kind of grassy green characteristic to me i definitely got darker and again i feel like that jammy tone that you're describing is is especially when comparing these two samples it's definitely a darker sample um than the other one which was more bright um but again tropical fruits i i think that in this case i was getting more of like that I used to drink a lot of mango Lusa when I was a kid. <laughs> very, very kind of cooked, uh, concentrated mango juice, papaya yeah. kind of fruit. And I would say to the point of kefir lime, I wrote down sage and bay, which I go. think is literally that same thing. It's just how the two of us are interpreting it slightly different. So exactly. when I summarize this, I wrote down caramelized pineapple, bergamot, and I actually put down grapefruit peel because the more okay. I sat with this like earthy herbal character um I think it's really pithy and I just think okay. it might be some of that pith character coming from Chicago. Okay.
I'm thinking about that. And the more you say that, the more I'm thinking it reminds me of like actually a grapefruit candy that I've had and I can't remember what it is, but. Even just like sugared citrus peel. Sugared you know? citrus peel, yeah, exactly. Definitely. Grassy, I'm not getting as so much, except maybe in that lemongrass or kefir lime, like galangal or what, oh, I've forgotten what the other um, like ingredient, turmeric? something used in that. I'm so. getting, um, I'm getting a pretty significant anise, but like that candy anise, you know? Okay. The like black licorice, uh, fruity side of anise. Um, okay. I do get some of that here. Anyway, this is, All we right. could kind of go on forever when it comes to this stuff. Um, we tend to. Yes, we do. So I think at this point, um, we're going to open it up to questions. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. It's <laughs> kind of a nice, uh, you know, introduction to how people in a sensory environment should be interacting when what they're looking at and things yeah. like that. So I will say though, Emily and I make it a point to not have these conversations until we're done. Yes. So like, <laughs> again, like I said before, make sure you come to your own opinion first and then have those conversations. But having those conversations are really important. No, it is. It, it definitely is. I mean, I've done some sensory with Emily and even when we've been talking about things that we did in house, um, there was other people making comments and I was like, oh yeah, you're right, you know? So, um, so we have some questions and first one that I'd like to start off with is uh, being a small brewery, what would you recommend we do to launch a sensory panel? Okay, there are many things that you can do to launch a sensory panel. I would say the first thing you should be doing if you're not already doing is taste your beer. Taste your ingredients and um, take notes. Yeah, I would say train, train, train. Do yeah. it, do it, do it. Uh, mm -hmm. You only learn by doing. Yeah. And then to the point of like flavor standards, Emily and I both agree strongly on the use of like whole food standards. So. I would go through a lexicon and just buy some of the things you see. Buy some orange juice, buy some bay leaves, buy some cardamom. If you're not familiar if with you what you don't know what it like, is, go to your spice cabinet. Go to the grocery store, buy a guava if you've never smelled a guava before. And then just literally pass around because again, I'm gonna talk sense memory, but like being able to be like, oh yeah, I remember smelling this when I was standing over there at that time of day, and it really struck a chord. And being able to recollect that will be very strong. Yeah. And another thing you can actually do is then take that and put it in your beer and find out, get some mango juice and spike a sample, not necessarily a lot, but enough that you can actually detect it in the beer. And yeah. you will actually find that that helps you get better at pulling those scents out of the beer. So do you, do you recommend that like, Say there's a brewery that has four employees. Do you recommend that they like kind of all sit together, pull what beer, dose everything, and kind of sit around and talk about it? If and... you have the time and the space, those kinds of things are very helpful. Understanding that not everyone will be able to do that. The best thing you can do is to practice those. Obviously, you should already be saying, is this good enough to go out to the customer? Okay. That kind of is where you should start. You know, uh, they, there's a couple names for that. There's like a, a, a yes, no panel or a true to type kind of like, does this, does this match what we want it to? And some brewers may not know, you know, we brewed this, we're not really sure what it's gonna taste like. You should still be asking, is this acceptable to go out? Right. And if there's only four of you doing that, then all four of you should be doing that. But recognizing that each of you may have different abilities. Some of you may be anosmic or not able to smell certain compounds. Um, if you only have four employees, yes, get everybody. If you have 50 employees and you can only get five or six of them, then do that, you know. The more the better, but also make sure that you're aware that literally not everyone is going to be able to smell everything. The best brewer may not be the best taster. I'm the sensory person here and I'm actually not what you consider a super taster, um, you know, and, and yet I still have the ability to have trained myself to be able to articulate this. I've been here a year and I've gotten better in that year at picking out flavors in hops and beer. 
So I would I would agree with everything Emily said. Numbers is a game. You know, yep. when you talk about science, the larger your sample pool, the better. That's yep. not always the case. Um, I will also echo Emily's sentiment of like this concept you've heard about super tasters and what you think that means is a lie. It doesn't <laughs> exist. There are not people out there that are incredible tasters based on some genetic predisposition. That's not a thing. Let that go. What there is, though, is super tasters and non-tasters to very specific compounds. And you can be a super taster to X, but a non-taster to Y. You know, it doesn't make you, if you're a super taster, typically people are talking about N-thiopropyl uracil. Like, there is a very specific compound that people talk about. So yeah. I'm a non-taster to pro, which means like my bitterness receptors are a little limited. I don't taste a lot of bitterness, the same strength that other people do. But I think that I'm a good taster because I'm, I have worked a long time in verbalizing my thoughts and being yes. able to translate what I'm tasting. Yes. So talk the about people it. people who are best at tasting are the people who are best at being able to translate what they are tasting, not necessarily the person with the best notes. Yeah, I mean, to that note, like, just how people have different perceptions of flavors. Take cilantro, for example, where some people get a soap profile and other people just love a ton of it. Or rosemary is another one that I, right. you know, I recall at certain family meals where somebody complains <laughs> and another person loves it, so. But, but to that point, and, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say in 1228, like, I am very sensitive to bergamot. I know that about me. So mm -hmm. I knew when I smelled bergamot that I had to write that down and then take a step to separate the bergamot from everything else. And, and just, you got to be aware of how you react to certain smells, and that comes with practice. Yeah. Right. Well, let's move on, because we have another good question. Uh, in sensory methods, when you're brewing on the pilot system, are you utilizing a simple smash recipe to evaluate the hops? And to that, I think we should also mention kind of what sort of that grist bill is, you know, that we do use when we are making a beer like, like that to, to get more of the hop sensory versus, you know, any of the malt build in there. Yeah, do you want to take that, Emily, or you want me to? I actually don't know anything about how they brew downstairs. So <laughs> I know some, so, but not, not, the, not the method, so. Yeah, so I work with Kane, who's the brewer at our technical center when we're doing full, full brews to do sensory. Um, and really the goal there is brew the most neutral base. Well, I should say there's two goals at the same time and they kind of run perpendicular to each other. One is brew the most neutral base because you really wanna make sure that you are getting the most pure interpretation of what you are trying to smell. So typically that will be a smash recipe. Sometimes we will use extract on the hot side just to simplify that if we know we're just looking for an aroma hop. And in that case, we'll just pick uh, an extract for the hot side that we know does not carry a lot of aroma to it. The other thing I will say, and I'll speak kind of out of the other side of my head, is um, you want to make sure that the sensory you're doing is applicable to the application that you're doing it. So if you are intending for a hop to go in a super hoppy or super dark beer, you don't want to do all of your testing in a very bland, very light base because it's not going to translate the same way. So there's a, there's a part of sensory that really focuses on doing your testing in the way that it will be perceived to the consumer is how a lot of sensory has been developed. So uh, a lot of it is based on consumer, but I would say don't brew a very neutral base if that's not your intended use of it. Um, but if you are just really trying to get the most pure interpretation of the hop, I would say go a smash recipe, go a really light malt, Use the hops on the hop side if you think you can. Otherwise, feel free to use an extract that's pretty low in any sort of aroma or flavor to it. Very nice. Uh, do you have any recommended sources for flavor standards, uh, Roxa or Sigma Aldrich? I think any of those are good. I would say that we utilize many different companies for those things. We've used a Roxa, we've used. Um, Flavor Active is actually something that we carry in the warehouses here. Um, so we tend to use Flavor Active a lot just because we have it and they have really good reference standards for things like Caddy that may be a little harder to replicate um, using a grocery store. Um, or Grainy. 
What's that? Grainy, the ultimate Grainy. one that like as a sensory panel is the most difficult thing to ever do. Grainy is really hard, especially because it interacts with the beer base. And so the base beer that you're utilizing and a lot of these, you will find that if you smell it and you're putting it in a beer and it doesn't smell right or you can't perceive it, try a different base beer first and see if that doesn't, if that doesn't fix it. Cause I've had, I've had some trouble with grainy for sure. Um, but yeah, Flavor Active, Aroxa, Sigma Aldrich, whoever has, you know, whoever you get your uh, chemical supplies through, you know, you can always, some of them, depending on how refined they are, make sure you're getting food grade though, if you're going to consume it. That would be my advice. Well, thanks guys. Um, that kind of wraps up our hour here at the end. Appreciate all of the uh, insight. I know I definitely learned some things and I have uh, <laughs> I have time tomorrow with you, Emily, on some yes, other. Yes, we're doing some more training tomorrow. So, yep. and feel free to reach out to our, our email address if you have any additional questions, you know, if you can't, you know, can point yeah, at least in the right direction. Yep, that's at uh, webinars at bsgcraft.com. So, um, so from all of us here at BSG, uh, again, don't forget to register for Friday's webinar. It is this Friday at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. And if we didn't get to your questions, like we said, email us at webinars at bsgcraft.com and we'll work to get some answers. So uh, if, from all of us here at BSG and RAR, thanks for tuning in and uh, we hope to see you soon. So. Take care. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Dan. Bye. All right. See ya.